Monkeys Mickey Dolans today on Pop Goes the Culture. Hi, I'm David Levin, and welcome to another perspicacious episode of Pop Goes the Culture. Today, part two of my three-part conversation with the man, the myth, the monkey, Mickey Dolenz. And he'll tell us about some of the legendary songwriters who composed the hits for the monkeys, including Carole King, Neil Diamond, David Gates, Harry Nielsen. Plus, you'll find out what happened when a monkey met a beetle. You guys had some great songwriters writing for you. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Can you talk about some of the people who, who wrote monkey songs? Besides the monkeys themselves, who else was who else was writing for you guys? Well, as a singer, and by the way, you know, obviously we did all the singing right from the get-go. Um, you know, I think that's probably one of the reasons why the songs stand up as well as they do. Because I'd like to think that obviously I had something to do with it, and singing and playing and, and the other guys. But, um, you know, there's, there's nothing that can beat a, a great song. You know, it's hard to knock a good song down. And when you have people writing for you, like, I remember when I first, cause I didn't know a whole lot about the music business at the time. I'd been playing live a little bit uh, in bands and cover bands and in bars and bowling alleys and stuff. But I, and I'd recorded actually already a couple of tunes, but I didn't know a whole lot about the business, you know. But I, um, I can't remember what I was saying now. What were we talking about? We were about songwriters. Oh, yeah. So I remember when I got cast in the show and they started uh, and the series and the pilot got sold. And now we were going to do a series and everything started changing. Uh, the head of the publishing division happened to be Screen Gems Publishing Music, which was the Brill Building in New York and a similar little facility out here on Sunset Boulevard. Not far from here, actually. And um, he said, you want to come by and meet the songwriters who are going to be writing songs for you? Because I had, I guess by then, they sort of fi- f- figured I was going to be the lead singer. I think more by default than anything else. Excuse me. More by default than anything else. And um, I'll never forget a wonderful man named Lester Sill. And he brought me up to this little apartment building on Sunset Boulevard that they'd converted into offices. And <clears throat> we walked down this hallway. It's like a doctor's you know, <laughs> office hallway. Little tiny rooms like, <laughs> like dentists. And um, knocks on the door, goes, hello? And he opens the door, and there's, oh, hi, Mickey, this is Carol King. Carol, this is Mickey. She's sitting at a little piano in this room, I swear, the size of a closet, piano and a woolen sack, reel-to-reel tape recorder. And it's, oh, hi, Mickey, hi, Carol, nice to meet you. Yes, I don't know. Hello. Hi, Mickey, this is David Gates. David, this is Mickey, and uh, you're going to be writing some tunes for you. This is Diane Hildebrand, Mickey. Hi, this is uh, Carol Bayer Sager. Hi, very nice to meet you. This is uh, Harry Nielsen. Harry Nielsen, hi, very nice to meet you. And in New York, of course, there's Neil Diamond and that whole, you know, crowd there. So, of course, at the time, you know, uh, one hadn't heard about, um, unless you were the industry, you wouldn't have known who these people were. But even at the time, they were huge I mean, Carol came back. By that time, she'd already written God knows how many huge hits. And, uh, and so um, they would submit uh, acetates to me of songs. And, you know, I don't ever remember hearing one that I went, oh, what a piece of crap. <laughs> I mean, they don't write a lot of junk tunes, those people, you know. So I think we were flush for choice. I mean, there was just so much wonderful material. And then they would match up, you know, songs with people and and stuff like that but there it was amazing and that's why i think those songs last you know carol king, king does not write many duff tunes no. was it was hers was pleasant valley sunday wasn't that, wasn't that well one of them oh yeah. yeah that was only one it was sometime in the morning um uh, take a giant step uh oh at least half a dozen or more You've talked a little bit about uh, the way your voice blends with, with some of the other guys, especially Mike. You want to talk a little bit about about the harmonies and the voices? Yeah. Um, as I said, I think that I, I kind of, I'm, again, I'm, I wasn't there, so I don't know who decided that I was going to sing most of the leads. But I think it probably because Mike, who I think has great songs and a great voice and sings really great, but he definitely has kind of a country rock sort of sensibility and which now of course is is huge but back then it was still fringe uh, and country was another world it really wasn't any any kind of fusion at all um, 
Peter was very, and still is, very folky, very bluesy, which is, was great, but again, not considered mainstream pop. David has a very Broadway, Anthony Newley sort of uh, music hall uh, presentation and voice, and a great voice, but again, back in 1965, not considered mainstream pop. So I was the one that could go, Why? You got the very wild Pleasant Valley Sunday! And sing like I'm, you know, have somebody <laughs> pinching me in the butt. <clears throat> so I could scream and, and hit the high notes and, and sound like a garage band singer, which is, in a sense is what The Monkees was. The Monkees was actually, remember, a television show about an imaginary band that didn't exist, and it still doesn't exist in, the, in, in any real sense, except as on the television show. We lived in an imaginary house and had these imaginary adventures, and sang these songs and had a great time, but it was about, it was imaginary, it wasn't real. And um, I've always maintained that, and whenever I go back and do a monkey show or do a, even do a concert, I always, the, the way I look at it is I'm going back and recreating the role that I played on that show as Christopher Lloyd when he goes back to do another Back to the Future 9, He's recreating that character that he created for that, for that series of movies. And um, that's the way I've always looked at it. And yet, the ima as imaginary as those things were, the songs were real, the albums were real, the, the chart toppers, were re those were real chart toppers made by an imaginary crew. Yeah, and that's kind of the weird... Did you see Galaxy Quest? Yeah, I The loved Tim it. Allen movie? Loved it. One of the best Star Trek movies ever. Ever. That was the story of the monkeys that this cast of this imaginary show got taken or called or, or asked by the aliens to be real. And in our case, this band that was on this television show was demanded by the fans and the public that we be real. And we did. Mike often said it's like uh, Pinocchio, you know, when he turned into a little boy. And I've often said it's like Leonard Nimoy really becoming a Vulcan. <laughs> Which is... <laughs> And that's kind of the truth. Now, having said that, we did all play and we did all sing. So, in a way, there was two groups. There was the four guys on the television show who had these, uh, these characters, used our real names, which con confusing, but played these characters in a way, sang those songs written by Carol and Neil and things like that. And then we went on the road and we became sort of another group that was just us. And we didn't have to do anything that anybody's... And we played it, and then we started recording our own songs. Headquarters was like the first album where we, like, we were given the, the power to do what we wanted. And we recorded everything, and we played everything. And, blah, blah. and so there's like these two, in a way. There's, there's always been almost like two groups. It's, it's bizarre. It's weird. Weird story. Wow. So when you guys broke up, it wasn't like... You know, you're not Yoko, right? No, no, no. Well, we, we never did break up. Right. The, the show went off the air. <laughs> And after the show went off the air, you know, we didn't, there was nowhere to go every day. And, you know, like uh, in Star Trek, to use your analogy, Leonard Nimoy and William Shatner didn't, you know, call, us, call each other up every day going, beam me up, Leonard. <laughs> okay, Captain. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't happen that way. But you now, can play music, they can't go out and fight no. Klingons. Well, no, they can do, uh, they can do, uh, well, they can do those like in the, like in Galaxy Quest. They can do those those uh, autograph shows. No, it's true. We 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 could and we did for a little while, not for very long, uh, as a as a foursome, and then as a threesome, and then over the years, Davy and I have ganged up again and done some shows. Peter and David and I went out in the '86. Had a huge reunion in '86. Mike just didn't want to do it, but then Mike joined us in '97. We went to England, sold out Wembley twice, had an English tour, and then David and Peter and I went out again over here and. But, um, and again, you know, they, would, they, might be they might tell you a very different uh, version of this from their point of view. Remember, you know, Rashomon? <laughs> well, this is very Rashomon because everybody has their own, you know, their own point of view. I'm just giving you my version of, of events and how I saw it, my perspective of it. As an actor, a child actor, I was hired to do another series, you know, and it was only about eight years after the, seven years after Circus Boy. 
And it didn't last very long, you know. The monkeys, the whole experience. I, I just did a musical on uh, on Broadway uh, and on the road, Aida, the Elton John musical, for a couple of years. And I was sitting in my dressing room one day waiting for to go on. And I just started figuring out how many shows I'd done, how many days I'd been on Aida, uh, months. And... Um, kind of added it up and I realized I was I had done Aida longer than I worked on the monkeys. That's amazing. Who'd have thought? Huh? Who'd have thunk, huh? <laughs> Which is, how did your life change after the monkeys went on the air? Well, I'm told I had a great time. <laughs> I don't remember a lot, but uh, contrary to popular belief, it wasn't so much for any other chemical reasons, just it was more to the, due to the fact that just so much was going on so fast. I don't remember a lot about Circus Boy for the same reason, having to film 10, 12 hours a day. And uh, in, in the case of the monkeys, the, the schedule, the, the pace of it was just intense. I mean, as soon as the show went on the air, it became so popular, and then there was all the publicity and all the press. And, the, and then besides having just the normal shooting day, which is, like I say, 10, 12 hours, then we'd have to go in the studio and, and record, and then on the weekends start rehearsing for the tour that was coming up. And so th those, I don't remember, I honestly don't remember a whole lot about those first uh, couple of years. You know, little snatches of memories will, will come in. And my life changed in, you know, the predictable ways, I suppose. Um, I didn't have any more privacy, and I was followed around, and I was harassed. And But then the upside is you're, you know, famous and rich and, you know, uh, and, and, and popular, and so, uh, but it, there's, there's an upside and a downside, I'm sure anybody will, anybody will agree. Um, it wasn't until way after the monkeys that I looked back and, and even realized what, what was going on, what a phenomenon it was. You talked about being an imaginary rock group, but you guys got to meet a lot of real rock groups, hmm? a lot of real musicians. You were real musicians, but people who... Well, groups that, that were put together, in the, or rather came together in a more traditional way, shall we say. Um, who were some of the people that you met during that era that stand out, that you do remember? Um, well, there was a number of, uh, of people that were fans, like uh, Frank Zappa, who asked me to be the drummer for the Mothers of Invention. Uh, after the monkeys uh, went off the air, but I couldn't. I was still under contract. That would have been interesting. He was a fan. He got it. He got the whole imaginary pop thing. Um, and he was a great guy. He was really nice. Um, and then, you know, oh, just all kinds of people, you know, hanging out with David Crosby and Stephen Stills and, and Harry Nielsen, who was one of my dearest friends. <clears throat> and then Alice Cooper, who became a very good friend and lived next door. And then, of course, the Beatles, I mean, meeting the Beatles, because I was a huge Beatle fan. We all were. Huge Beatle fan. And, again, contrary to popular belief, there really wasn't any competition going on there, because they really had moved on and had an older... They had, their fans were the older brothers and sisters of our fans. You know, we had 10- and 12-year-olds, and the Beatles had, like, by that time, 16, 18, 20-year-olds. But meeting them was pretty, uh, pretty special. Tell me about that. Well, the first, the first person I met uh, was Paul, and it was uh, on a press junket to England, getting ready to promote a tour. And they had a big photo op with him and I, Monkey Meets Beetle. And um, we, we hit it off and, you know, had a wonderful, you know, chat. And, um, you know, he got it. They got it. They understood what the whole monkey thing was all about. He invited me to a recording session at Abbey Road for this new album they were doing called... Um, Lieutenant Popper, no, Sergeant Salt, no, Sergeant Pepper, that's it. And whatever happened to that album? And I went down to Abbey Road. I'll never forget this, actually. I went down to Abbey Road, and I was expecting this insane, love-in, be-in, Beatle-fest, pop gear, fab, you know, happening Woodstock thing. So I got all dressed up for that. I had on, you know, double-knit paisley bell-bottoms and a silk brocade thing and glasses and my hair and beads and... Oh, must have looked like a total idiot. And um, the limo picks me up, brings me to the, to the session. That he invited me to one of the sessions. And I brings me up to the room. I walk in like... And it's empty. It's like 
my, it looked like my high school gymnasium. There was like neon lights and four, three folding chairs and a drum set, a couple amps. And the guys were sitting there all for, in jeans and T-shirts just playing. And I'm like, whoa, man, where's the, where's the party? Where are the girls? <laughs> and, and John Lennon says, you know, you want to hear what we're working on? And they, I look up and George Martin's up in the booth above with the engineer. He's wearing like this three-piece suit. And there's a four-track tape recorder, four-track tape recorder. And he hits the button and uh, the tracks of Good Morning, Good Morning come up. And... Um, <laughs> I was just like, whoa, man, I better shut up and just try not to make a total fool out of myself. But that's how they managed to do all that, to accomplish so much in a relatively brief period of time. Is that they, and I understand that John was really this kind of slave driver. He was the guy that would get him down there in the studio every day, 10, 12-hour days, just playing and writing and playing and writing and playing. and just Like, like in the mines, you know, down the mines, lads. Well, he had so many. I mean, they did an entire hundred episode radio series just of the lost Lennon tapes and the stuff that he yeah. did when he would just be working on stuff. Yeah. Like, so it's, you can imagine how that would be. You guys did a movie called Head, mm -hmm. <laughs> which, interestingly enough, a lot of people who were my age at the time that Head came out had no idea that such a movie existed until years later. Can yeah. you sort of walk me through the story of Head? Well, when Bob and Bird came to me and, and asked, you know, about, or said that we wanted to do a movie, I wanted to do a movie, I was very enthusiastic about it and, and uh, you know, thought it was a great idea. Um, I remember having conversations, again, this is just my recollections, um, having conversations about the kind of movie that we wanted to make. Um, and I don't remember who suggested it at first, but uh, it, was, it was being bandied about that we don't try to make just a 90-minute version of one of the television shows. Because we'd already done that for like a couple of years. And at the time, it sounded like a great idea. <laughs> In retrospect, the movie probably would have been much more successful if it had been a 90-minute version of one of the television shows. But everybody kind of wanted to move on. They were all, we were already getting, you know, um, antsy about doing the same kind of show on the television series every week. So we, I, I remember saying, yeah, that's a great idea. That's what I'd like to do, too. And then he brought this guy to the set one day, this young uh, B-movie actor who wanted to write and direct movies. Uh, and he was an incredibly wonderful, charismatic, funny guy named Jack Nicholson. And he uh, started hanging out. And we just, he spent months in my house, and Mike's, David Peters' house, hanging out on the set, you know, talking and about what we wanted to do, what we didn't want to do. And then we all went up to Ojai, California, the golf and spa resort. I remember one weekend and stayed like four days, you know, um, in a room with a tape recorder. I got 60 millimeter footage of this, of us sitting there around this tape recorder talking about the kind of movie we wanted to make. And out of that came the movie Head, which is weird. I'm still not sure what it's all about. Uh, Jack scripted it, just scripted the movie. I thought he did a great job. Bob Ravelson directed it. I thought he did a great job. Starred uh, Victor Mature and Annette Funicello and Sonny Liston and Carol Doda and Frank Zappa. And uh, and Jack was in it, and Peter Fonda, and Dennis Hopper. And, you know, it was uh, strange. Um, the fans couldn't even get in to see it because it was R-rated. But it is the opportunity that we got to make some statements, political and social and otherwise. And, you know, it stands up. Parts of it stand up today, you know. Parts of it are real boring, but parts of it stand up. When was the last time you saw it? Oh, years ago. What was it about? Well, you'd have to ask Jack that, <laughs> uh, to be honest, because I'm not even sure to this day. It was a deconstruction of, I think, Hollywood and the whole, and the business, and the monkeys, and the whole pop culture phenomena, but, you know, skewed towards the, the Hollywood angle of it all. Uh, a very deconstructionist, uh, satirical and biting and dark, at times, 
I mean, there one, at one point in the movie, because um, there was so much merchandising going on with the monkeys, monkey lunch boxes, monkey uh, T-shirts, monkey underwear, monkey glasses, monkey, uh, the whole range of dolls. monkey dolls, monkey everything. And at one point in the in the film, this crazy guy that's like our manager or something comes out and he says, I've got it. Monkey body fluids. <laughs> He's talking about marketing our our various body fluids. <clears throat> um, it was very dark, and, and I don't want to say necessarily ahead of its time, but but it. Uh, so I, I I did some great work in it as just an actor, you know. I thought and had a lot of fun doing it. So if you were playing Mickey the monkey on the TV show, who were you playing in this movie? Well, still. I was still was playing. It the same character, or was it a, was it an alternate universe version of? This, of yeah, this a little character? bit, I guess. It was a darker, a darker version. By then, you know, I mean the, the the line the line of demarcation or the distinction between fantasy and reality was probably very was opaque at best, and or, or translucent at best. You know, it. Um, but I guess th that was something, you know, that uh, looking back now, I realized that I was just doing that naturally because of just being in the business so long. That's why after the monkeys, I was, it was easy for me to just cut it off and move on, you know. Um, it got very frustrating when I'd go into an audition for another part for a pilot or something, and somebody would say, what are you doing here? We don't need any drummers. <laughs> it's like, wow, oh, jeez. See how convincing you were as an actor? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I played the part too good. And that also came from the fact that they uh, used our real names, you know, which you don't tend to do on a television on a television show. You tend to have character names, but in our case, they somewhere down the line, they decided to use our real names. And that may have added to the success and to the, you know, to the connection with the fans and stuff like that. And when I say I'm playing a character, I mean it's, it was a, um, a caricature of me. But again, I'm, I'm, this is my, only my personal, you know, point of view. David or Peter or Mike may have a very different perception of that, you know. Like Peter, for instance, Peter I know because he has said so that he doesn't feel that way at all. He, he says he felt it was him and he was in a group. Right. Almost like Jerry Seinfeld on Seinfeld playing a uh, stand-up comedian yeah. named Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. Is he that person or is he that character yeah. on TV? Yeah. Maybe a version. In the monkey in in the monkey show, I was obviously a caricature. I mean, I don't walk around all day going, "Whoa, whoa no, whoa, Mike." Is this true? <laughs> <laughs> Just want to get, as long as I have somebody here to get it. <laughs> That's it for today. Next time, Mickey Dolenz talks about some of the great Monkees guest stars, reunions, what happened when Jimi Hendrix opened for the Monkees, and is it really possible that the Monkees could have done Sugar Sugar? What other songs did the Monkees turn down? Which ones did they want and didn't get? All that and more on the next Pop Goes the Culture. I'm David Levin. Thanks for watching, and please subscribe.